All right, so welcome everyone to this week's What Physicists Do. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Knapp, uh, who will be telling us about quantum computing with the topological phase of matter. So Dr. Knapp got her bachelor's degree from Williams College before attending UC Santa Barbara for her PhD in physics. And now she's coming to us from Microsoft down in, you work, is it in Goleta where it actually is or Santa Barbara? I think it's technically in Santa Barbara because it's on UCSB campus. Oh, great. Oh, I knew that. So I'm <laughs> on the UCSB campus still. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Knapp. Can't wait to hear what you have to tell us. All right, thanks. So thanks for the nice introduction. I'm excited to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about some of my research, which is in the field of quantum computing with a topological phase of matter. And to give you a sense of where we're going today, um, we're going to start off with a quick review of what a classical computer is and, and basically the key ideas behind classical computing so that we can talk about how quantum computing is different and what things you should pay attention to that are really special about a quantum computer. So I know that probably most of you were at the colloquium last week, which was also on quantum computing. So this first half of the talk is probably going to be some review. I'm sure I'm going to explain it in a different way. Um, but if you weren't at the talk last week, we will also go over quantum computing. So you know, don't worry about it. You're not missing anything. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, we're going to switch gears a little bit. And we're going to go to a more condensed matter angle and ask, what are topological phases of matter? We're going to look in more detail at a particular topological phase of matter that are Majorana nanowires. We'll look at how you can build what are called topological qubits out of these systems. And then at the end of the talk, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of describe my career trajectory and how I fit into all of this and how I became interested in this field. So I do want to encourage you, if at any point of the, of the talk you have questions or you want to spend more time on one of the slides, you know, there's a lot of material here. We definitely don't have to go through all of it. Um, so I, I don't have a particular agenda. So you should feel free to interrupt at any point, either raise your hand or just go ahead and speak up and that will be great. Okay, so our one slide review of classical computing and what you should have in mind. When I say classical computing, this is basically every computer that currently exists. So everyone is joining me from some type of classical computer right now. And I wanna highlight three aspects of classical computing. Usually you store your information in bits, which are your basic unit of information. And so this is gonna be something that's either a zero or a one. So it's just a binary variable. It has one of two options. And you can think of this as being, for instance, a coin that's either face up or face down, and I label the two sides by zero or one. Then a classical computer will also have some set of logic operations. So this just tells me I take as input some bits, and then I output some new bits that are potentially different depending on what my input bits were. So these are two examples. I could have what's called a not gate that flips the value of a bit. So I input a zero, I output a one, or I input a one and I output a zero. Or I can also have logic operations that take multiple inputs and give me one output. So an example of that is the AND gate, which takes its input bits A and B and outputs A times B. So if A and B were both zero, I would output zero. If A and B were both one, I'd output one. And if either A or B is zero, I'd output zero. And then the reason why logic operations are important is that you can actually string together a bunch of these logic operations to implement some algorithm that you're actually doing a calculation you're interested in the answer for. And so of course, there's this whole field of how do you come up with the best algorithms? What's the most efficient way to program your computer? But the key idea is that I have some basic set of logic operations that are available, and that's gonna determine what types of algorithms I can actually run on the system. And then the last thing is uh, nothing in life is perfect. Our classical computers suffer from errors. So you can imagine if I had a bunch of coins on a table and that there's an earthquake and some of them are gonna flip their value, that would be something that is changing the, the information that I've tried to store in my computer. So I need some way of correcting errors. And a very simple scheme to do that is I can just, instead of storing information in one of these coins, I could have a large collection of coins that are all supposed to be in the same value. So here I might imagine that all of these coins are supposed to have value zero and I've accidentally undergone some errors where some of them have flipped to one. And so I could correct for these errors by just periodically looking at all of my coins, all of my bits and saying, are they all the same value? And if they're not, I wanna flip the minimal number of these coins so that they are all the same value. And then I've returned to uh, whatever my code space is. So this is a very simple type of error correction. You can get into much more complica 
complicated classical error correction. Um, but this is just one idea you can have in mind where I protect myself from errors by storing my information redundantly. Quantum computing is different from classical computing because I'm storing my information in a quantum two-level system rather than a classical two-level system. And so we call this a quantum bit or a qubit for short. And for the history buffs out there, that name qubit actually comes from the ancient Egyptian, I can't quite see my arm, ancient Egyptian measure, which was the pharaoh's um, elbow to their fingertips. That was some unit of distance called a qubit. So it's a play on words. Um, for anyone interested in the origin of the name. But essentially the key idea behind a two level quantum system is I have some set of bases where I can do a measurement for the system. So the fact that it's two levels means in any of these measurement bases, I always have one of two outcomes. I'll always either be zero or I'll be one. But before I do a measurement, I can actually be simultaneously in both of those states. So I can be in what's called a superposition state. And we represent this usually by saying, the state lies somewhere on the surface of this block sphere. So in this case, I would say I could do a measurement along any, um, any axis of the sphere. So here I'm highlighting x, y, and z axes. And I'm writing the qubit state in the 0 and 1 along the z axis basis. But really, my state corresponds to this yellow line, which is at some angle from the z axis and some angle from the x and y plane. And then the, the fact that the state is here means that if I try to do a measurement in the Z basis, I'm gonna to project to either the North or the South pole. So I'll actually end up changing the state of the qubit. So in particular, what these, number, what these angles are telling me is the probability of projecting to the Z equals zero state or the Z equals one state. And so it's not too important, but the, the way I've written this here, the probability of getting Z equals zero for this initial state would be cosine squared theta over two and the probability of getting z equals one would be sine squared theta over two. So the first takeaway is that when I have a quantum two level system, I always have just two measurement outcomes, but I have an infinite number of possible qubit states. So the state space is much bigger than, what, than was the case for a classical system. The next important thing is that the type of measurement I do actually matters. So if I choose to, instead of measuring along the z axis, I measure along the x axis, I'm now gonna have a different probability distribution associated with what is now x equals zero or x equals one. And for this particular state, it turns out to be these two probabilities. And so what you see is that measurement is changing the state of the system. So if I measure along the x-axis, I'll end up either in x equals zero or x equals one. And now I've changed the state. So if I repeat the x measurement, I'll have 100% probability of just getting the same measurement outcome over and over again. So the key ideas behind what's different for a qubit as opposed to a bit is that I have this larger state space. I can simultaneously be in states zero and one in this sense of simultaneous has to do with the probability distributions of when I do a measurement. Measurement is changing the state and the order of my measurements matters because measurement is changing the state. So if I do a Z measurement and I do an X measurement and then I repeat an X measurement, I'll have a hundred percent probability of ending up in the same X measurement state but if I did a Z measurement, an X measurement, and then a Z measurement, I would then have a 50% probability of either state. So this is a rather fast review of this block sphere. If it doesn't make sense to you, you don't have to worry so much. The important thing is just that superposition is something that doesn't happen for a classical bit. It's making my state space larger and it's making my bit, my qubit act probabilistically in some sense. The other important difference for a quantum computer compared to a classical computer is that quantum systems also have something called entanglement. So entanglement is something where it can be impossible to specify the state of part of the system independently of the rest of the system. So for the example I'm thinking about here, I imagine that I have two entangled qubits and I'm writing one of them as a green qubit and one of them as a blue qubit. And this would be a particular state where I'm in an equal superposition of both qubits having x equals zero or both qubits having x equals one. And the first part of this, this entanglement sentence just means I can't tell you the complete information about the green qubit without also telling you something about the blue qubit. So I can't just say that the green qubit is in an equal superposition of being in the state zero or one. Instead, I need to say that both of these qubits are are going to have x equals 0, or they're both going to have x equals 1. 
So another way of saying that is that qubits can correlate their measurement outcomes. So this means if I measure the state of the green qubit and I measure that x equals zero, I've collapsed onto this set of possibilities. And that means I have 100% probability of the next measurement telling me that the blue qubit is in the state x equals zero, even though I didn't measure the state, even though I didn't measure the blue qubit. So the essential idea behind quantum computing is that I have these two new concepts that didn't show up for a classical computer. I have quantum two level systems that can be in superposition. And I also have entanglement, which is telling me that multiple qubits can interact with each other in this funny way where they can correlate their measurement outcomes. And the key idea here is that while a classical computer had some set of logic operations that you could do where I specify some input and it gives me some output, I have a new set of logic operations for a quantum computer. I have a richer set of possibilities. And that just means that I have a broader set of possibilities for what types of algorithms I can do. And so while a quantum computer can do any classical algorithm, it can also use different uh, logic operations which might be able to solve certain problems more efficiently. And this is really the big motivation for why people are excited about quantum computing, is this hope that certain problems that are too hard for us to solve on a classical computer and too hard here literally just means we don't know a way to solve them. So we haven't pro proved that they're too hard. It's just no one's come up with some efficient solution for how you would do it. Um, but it is possible to have an efficient way to solve them on a quantum computer, which would mean it would open up a whole new realm of possibilities. So some of the problems that people think about when they're um, trying to come up with applications for quantum computing fall into these three categories of optimization, quantum simulation, and cryptography. So optimization, this is a type of problem that shows up all the time in industry. This is, I had input some desired outcome along with a set of constraints. So, you know, if I'm Amazon, I have a set of packages I need to deliver and I have a set of constraints of, I've promised people I'm gonna deliver these in a certain number of days and I wanna do so in the most cost-effective way. And so I input this along with all of the possible delivery methods, all the possible costs of those. And then the computer is supposed to optimize that and output the most cost-effective and fast way to satisfy all my constraints. And so a quantum computer can take advantage of this idea of superposition and entanglement to kind of speed up some of the ways that you might go about solving an optimization problem. The next category is something called quantum simulation. And this is this idea that I want to model some other quantum system. So it's not made out of qubits. It might be some bigger quantum system. And it's hard to do that on a classical computer. And that's really related to this idea that a classical bit really just has the two outcomes. It can be a zero or one, but a quantum system has this infinite state space. And so in order to really capture that infinite state space, I need a lot of classical bits. And so it can be very um, expensive to, to model a quantum system. Now you might wonder, why do I care so much about modeling quantum systems if I'm not just some physicist who's interested in understanding some exotic phase of matter? And there's lots of reasons to be interested in understanding quantum systems. If we understood high temperature superconductivity, there's all sorts of new applications that would make us have more efficient transportation. They would open up a new realm of what we could do with technology. If I had the ability to model some large molecules, it could help me understand how viruses work. It could help me design better drugs to come up with better medicines. And so there's a whole realm of possibilities with quantum simulation. The last category here, cryptography, this was really the first breakthrough or at least from my understanding, the first breakthrough of when people started getting really excited about quantum computing. And here the idea is that some of our classical error correcting codes, or sorry, some of our classical cryptography scheme, uh, so how we encode information so that other people can't eavesdrop on it. So for instance, how someone can't just steal your credit card information and, and take all of your money. Those are really based on the fact that some problems are hard for a classical computer to solve. So the most famous one of these is your credit card information is safe because it's hard for a classical computer to figure out how to factor a really large number. But it turns out that there are efficient quantum algorithms for how to solve those same problems. And so a quantum computer might be able to break some of these codes and then your credit card information is no longer safe. And so that might sound like a weird motivation for wanting to build a, a quantum computer. I wanna build it so I can break all of these classical codes. But there's a flip side that I could replace all of these cryptographic schemes by quantum cryptography schemes that are actually unbreakable in the sense that rather than relying on something that's hard to solve, they're relying on some physical law that makes it impossible to eavesdrop on the information. 
So if that sounds kind of um, out there, the thing to remember is that if I do a measurement on a quantum system, it's actually changing the state of the quantum system. So you might imagine if I'm sending information through a quantum system and someone's trying to eavesdrop on that information and figure out what it is, they're actually doing a measurement on that information. And so they're inadvertently changing the message. And so then you have a way of encoding things so that you know if someone was trying to eavesdrop in or if someone was trying to steal your information. So these are not the only areas where people look for efficient, um, efficient algorithms for quantum computing that might outperform classical computing algorithms, but these are some of the most famous areas where people are interested. So as I mentioned, this has generated a lot of excitement in how do you build a quantum computer and quantum computing research in general. And this is a broad field and if people are interested in it from all sorts of fields. So I'm coming at this from a condensed matter theory perspective. People are interested in this in atomic molecular optical physics. People are interested in this from quantum information physics. People are interested in this who aren't physicists but are mathematicians or computer scientists or engineers or probably this whole other range of fields who are material scientists. So this is a really broad field. There's a lot of room. If you're interested in quantum computing, there's probably space for you in this field to do research in it. Some of the main questions, just from my perspective, on what people are trying to figure out for quantum computing research is how do you build a quantum computer? Everyone has their own favorite system. That's the best way to go about this. How do you program a quantum computer? Maybe you're fine with letting someone else build the thing. You don't care so much about the experiments. But you want to really understand how do I get my classical computer to talk to my quantum computer and tell it to solve the problems that I'm interested in? Or maybe you're interested in what problems can a quantum computer solve? Why should I build a quantum computer? What's the most useful thing I could do with that quantum computer? Or what are the things I should really try to avoid anyone from doing with a quantum computer? So I've kind of artificially listed these three different um, settings in which people do quantum computing research. These aren't the only options, but generally I see the three main pillars of quantum computing research being academia, so meaning university research, government labs. Uh, so here I'm mostly thinking about the US, but all sorts of countries are doing quantum computing research and also companies. So for instance, I'm coming to you from Microsoft. I'm pretty sure you heard about uh, someone who was part of Google's quantum computing group last week. There are all sorts of startups as well as big corporations. Amazon also has a quantum computing group. Uh, and so there's lots of different areas where you could do quantum computing research. You could be in any of these settings and be answering any of these questions. So again, this is somewhat artificial what I've listed under each of these areas, but this is just meant to be generally the focus if you're in academia versus in a company versus in government labs tends to be more aligned with one of these bullet points. So this is not always true and you're not limited in any of these places. Uh, so for instance, in academia, often people are interested in understanding fundamental questions about what a quantum computer's capabilities are, or showing a proof of concept demonstration of some aspect of quantum computing. Versus in a government lab, your focus might more be on what are the implications of quantum computing? What are the different ways a quantum computer could be used? And how should the government be thinking about that? What types of regulatory processes might they need? What do they need to keep an eye on? You might also be thinking about capabilities of different quantum systems. So maybe you haven't chosen your favorite quantum system yet, but you wanna understand what different ways of building a quantum computer might be better suited to different types of problems. Versus if you're at a company, your company probably already has some program set where they've chosen their favorite quantum computing system. And now they're trying to go ahead and build a large scale quantum computer so that they can do some of these useful problems and actually make a profit using that type of quantum computer. They might also be especially interested in efficient quantum algorithms. So again, you could be in any of these settings and be looking at any of these aspects. And this is my artificial categorization of, of different focus areas. If you're curious about quantum computing research in general or what it's like doing quantum computing research in academia or at a government lab or at a company, you should definitely feel free to ask either now or later in the talk I've had a little bit of experience with government labs, more experience with quantum computing research in academia as a college student, as a grad student, as a postdoc. And of course, now I'm with Microsoft, so I also have some experience in what quantum computing research looks like for me in a company. Okay, so I've just gone through, hopefully you're excited about quantum computing. Hopefully you believe that there's something useful a quantum computer could do. There's a reason that we wanna build it. And hopefully now you also see, oh, there's all these different settings where people are doing quantum computing research. This is becoming a very large field that's attracting a lot of talent. 
So what's the challenge? Why don't we actually have a quantum computer yet? And the answer is the thing that's a lot harder about building a quantum computer compared to a classical computer is that qubits are very sensitive to noise. So one way of thinking about this is instead of storing my information in some, instead of storing it in a zero or a one, and so in order to have some error, I have to actually flip the bit of information. I'm now storing my information at some point on a sphere. And if anything comes in, any noise comes in, like a small temperature fluctuation or some small electric field or small magnetic field and slightly perturbs the state, so just moves it a little bit, that counts as an error. And those errors accumulate over time, and those are problems. They're especially problems if it's coming from the environment, so just things around your, your experiment that you can't quite control. And they both interact with, so they slightly move the state, they can also accidentally measure your qubit and measurement changes your qubit state. So the issue is we need our qubits to overcome this noise. We need to overcome this noise sensitivity in some way because we need our qubits to live as long as the length of the quantum algorithm that we're trying to do. Now, this wouldn't be such a problem if we had a really short quantum algorithm so that we could have a really sensitive qubit and actually get something out of it. But so far, all of the useful algorithms that we know about all of the questions on the previous slide about optimization or quantum simulation or cryptography, all of those are very long. They're much longer than the state, the lifetime of any of the qubits we've built so far. And they also require having a lot of qubits. And so I need a way of having my qubits survive all this noise. And I need a way of building enough qubits that are surviving all of this noise that I can actually do something useful. So there are two main approaches to overcoming this noise sensitivity. And the first one, and this is probably the most popular one, is called quantum error correction. And so some of you might have heard something about this last week, but this is somewhat similar to the idea of classical error correction, where instead of storing my information in one qubit, I'm gonna store a logical qubit, so it's still a single piece of information, but I'm gonna store it in a lot of physical qubits. And here I'm calling my qubits static qubits or measure qubits based on what their role is in the quantum error correcting code. So the basic idea is the same. I'm going to spread my information around. But something that's tricky is that I need to correct errors in the quantum system without measuring the logical qubit state. And I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but the reason why I need this second bullet point is because in quantum mechanics, if I do a measurement, it will change my state. And so I don't want my error correction to be changing the state of the system. So I need a way of measuring at the fact that an error has occurred without changing the state of the system. So preserving the qubit state. So there are lots of clever schemes for how to do this. Here I'm illustrating something called a stabilizer code where I measure different subsets of the system. So here I'm doing measurements on four of these data qubits. And this is a way where I use a measure qubit, one of these black qubits in the middle to help me with this. And it turns out that if you create the right type of code space, you can do these subspace measurements where it can just tell you whether I'm in a code space or not. And then if I'm not in a code space, I can correct it. But it doesn't actually tell me what the logical qubit state is. So uh, you know that might sound like an unsatisfactory answer. There's a whole realm of quantum error correction. This is actually a very accessible field uh, without knowing very much more than just Pauli matrices. So sigma x and sigma y and sigma z, you can play around with and really understand some of these quantum error correction codes. And this is a great way to get into the field. But I'm not going to say any more here unless someone has a specific question. The main issue with quantum error correcting codes is you run into a scalability problem. So in order to do this type of quantum error correcting code, I need to do lots, I need to have lots of physical qubits to store my single logical qubit. And then if I need a lot of logical qubits for my algorithm, then this really explodes in terms of resources that are needed. And then also I need to constantly be doing error correction. So I need a lot of fast and repetitive measurements. And so here I'm trying to indicate I need to constantly be measuring all of these qubits in these two different bases, the red and the blue bases. So this ends up being really resource intensive. And we're at an exciting point in the field where groups that are trying to demonstrate quantum error correction are just at the point where they can start showing some improvement from quantum error correction on very small systems. So systems of nine to 25 qubits. But it's gonna be a while before we can do a large scale quantum error correcting system and we can actually make our qubits good enough that they're gonna be useful for some long algorithm. 
So this was the first approach to overcoming noise sensitivity. The second one, and this might sound obvious, is to just try to use better qubits. So try to develop qubits that are gonna be protected in some way. And so this is obviously a cartoon, um, but the idea I'm trying to depict here is if instead of storing your information in some local property, like this point on the surface of a sphere, I instead store my information in how many times does a line wind around this non-contractible cycle on the torus, which is just the surface of a donut. Then even if I have some local noise coming in that's changing the state somewhere, so maybe I have something that coming in that makes this line instead of being a perfect circle, it wiggles it a little bit. It doesn't change the fact that this winds around the cycle once. If this line wound around the cycle twice, again, it, would be, it wouldn't care about this local noise. So this would really be storing information in something that's quantized to an integer rather than a continuous variable. And so that's meant to convey this sense of, I can withstand some set of noise and I have to have something really big coming in that actually breaks apart the line and then winds it around and then rejoins the line. And those events are gonna be much more rare. And this is basically the idea behind topological quantum computing which is gonna be the focus of today's talk. So the idea is to store our quantum information or to build qubits um, out of a topological phase. And so this word topological phase is not gonna have any meaning to most of you right now because I haven't told you what it is. We'll go over this in a little bit. But the key idea is that it has some non-local property and you can be thinking of this as it's storing information, for instance, in a winding number rather than in a point on, a, on the surface. And the whole motivation is that if I store my information non-locally in some way, it's going to be protected from local noise. So it won't be protected from all noise, but it's going to be protected from the majority of noise that is going to affect the system. And so there's a trade-off between this approach of topological quantum computing or other protected, uh, protected qubit schemes compared to quantum error correction. And this is, it's a lot harder to build a single qubit if I need to find a topological phase and store information in this complicated way. But if I'm able to build a single qubit, then I don't need as much error correction. And so it's gonna be more scalable in the long run. And so it's essentially a trade-off of, do I do the really hard thing right away? Or do I do the thing that I know how to do and I build up enough experience with that and then do the hard thing later on? And so that's basically how I'm thinking about quantum error correction versus building topological qubits. Okay, so we're now at the halfway point of the talk. Hopefully now there's a sense of what is different about a quantum computer from a classical computer. Uh, there's a sense of who researches quantum computers, some of the questions that they study, and also hopefully you have some idea of what, what's the challenge, what's holding us back from building a useful quantum computer so far. This is a great time to pause and ask a question about anything related to classical computing or quantum computing. And otherwise we're gonna switch gears a little bit to take a more condensed matter approach for the rest of the talk. And I'll let you think of your questions while I have some water. And I'll add as usual, um, you're welcome to type them in the chat if you prefer to do that instead of unmuting yourself. Okay, great. So I know that you had a really excellent colloquium last week. So you probably had all your questions about quantum computing already answered, but if they occur to you later, feel free to, to go ahead and type them in the chat or interrupt. So for the second half of the talk, we're now gonna talk about what is a topological phase of matter so that we can understand the second part of the title of quantum computing with a topological phase of matter. We're gonna look at this particular example of a topological phase of matter, which has this fancy name called Myron and nanowires. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about topological qubits. And then lastly, we'll talk about me, <laughs> which will probably be the least interesting part of the talk for most of you. Okay, so I mentioned that I'm a condensed matter theorist. So condensed matter is the study essentially of phases of matter. So this means I have some chunk of material and I'm interested in how do I qualitatively describe the material even as I change parameters. So for instance, some phases of matter that you're probably familiar with are solids versus liquids. So if I have a solid, the solid basically stays the same until I increase the temperature enough that it melts into a liquid. So at that point, it undergoes a phase transition. 
But even if I have the solid, solid and I'm below the phase transition and I keep the temperature, you know, slightly different, but kind of in the same range, it, it basically acts the same. It has the same properties. You can also have phases of matter that are magnetic. So for instance, I could have a ferromagnet. This is something that acts like a magnet, even if I don't apply an external magnetic field. Or I could have something that acts like a paramagnet, where when I don't apply a magnetic field, it doesn't have any magnetic properties, and then I have to apply a magnetic field to make it magnetic. Um, and again, I can have a transition between a ferromagnet and a paramagnet by increasing the temperature. So I'm going to label uh, both of these types of phases as conventional phases of matter. So up until 1980, condensed matter physicists thought we had figured it out. We thought we understood how phases of matter worked. We thought we understood phase transitions. And the idea is that they could always be identified by some local observable, which means I could just zoom into some part of the system. I could look at a certain property in just that local patch of the system, and I could tell you what the phase of matter was. So for instance, if I have a solid and I zoom in and I look at how the atoms in the solid are arranged, I'm going to find that they form some type of crystal structure. And so I could look at the, the symmetry of the atoms in space and I could say, okay, they're forming a crystal. I know I have a solid, even without looking at the whole system. Versus if I have a liquid, I have atoms that are freely moving. So they're translationally symmetric. So in this case, I would know that, okay, I'm not in the solid phase, I'm in a liquid phase. And so what I'm trying to hint at here is that not only did we think we could understand these phases of matter by just looking at some local observable, we always thought we could connect that local observable to some type of symmetry of the system. So as in another example, if I think about the ferromagnet versus the paramagnet, I could think about the spins of these different atoms. And in a ferromagnet, I could go, I could zoom in, I could measure a local patch of what's called the magnetization, which is essentially telling me, are the spins aligned, in which case they're a ferromagnet, or are the spins disordered, in which case they're a paramagnet. So again, this is some symmetry of the system that's distinguishing the two phases. Um, and the, so, the, so the way that I distinguish these two phases from this local observable, and the fancy name for it is something called a local order parameter. And for all conventional phases, this local order parameter is just some continuous number that is going to be positive, and then it's going to decrease, and then it's going to be zero in the other phase. And so that's essentially measuring what's called the degree of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So telling me whether I formed a crystal or I have a translationally symmetric system, or whether my spins are aligned, or if I have a rotationally symmetric system. OK, but of course, this isn't the full story, because I said until 1980, we thought we had figured out phases of matter. So this all changed with the discovery of topological phases, which cannot be identified by a local observable. So one way of thinking about this is if I had a sphere, and I look at some patch on the surface, and I also have a torus, and I look at some patch on the surface, Locally, they look identical. And in order to tell them apart, I have to zoom out and actually look at some global property of the system. This is essentially the idea behind topology, which is the mathematical study of continuous deformations. So I always think about topology in contrast to geometry. So in geometry, I care about distances and I care about angles. Maybe you've heard the phrase metric, I care about metrics. In topology, I throw all of that out and I just ask, I have this chunk of Play-Doh, can I smooth, smoothly deform something into some other chunk of Play-Doh? If I can, then they're topologically equivalent. And if I can't, if I have to like poke a hole in the system, then they're distinct. Um, one fun aspect of topology is there's this field of knot theory that you can think about where I imagine I have some closed loop of string and everything that I can um, shape that string into without breaking it apart is considered topologically equivalent. So for instance, the closed loop of string is topologically equivalent to if I twist the string. But it's different than if there was a knot in the string because there's no way to unknot this closed loop without first cutting it apart. So the idea behind a topological phase is that I have some phase of matter where all of the symmetries are the same and I have to do something big to it to make it undergo a phase transition and this, this isn't going to be a continuous thing. This isn't going to be able to be detectable by any local measurement. Instead, I have to look at some global property of the system. So since I'm a theorist, I could spend the whole talk only showing you these types of cartoons. And you might say, OK, I have no idea if topological phases are real or if this is just like a figment of her imagination. So they are real. 
there are different experimental systems where people have found topological phases or where they actively search for topological phases. And so this slide is meant to give you a sense of different places where people look for top, to, uh, topology to show up in physics. So the first is in two-dimensional materials. So for instance, you can think about graphene, which is a single layer of carbon atoms. And one that's become very popular to look for topological phases lately is if you take two layers of graphene, you stack them on top of each other, and then you twist them, you end up forming some interference pattern between their two different lattices. And if you're at the right twist angles, you can end up having some really interesting things happen to their energy structures, where you can make them um, have very, very flat energy bands and momentum space. And this ends up being a prime place to look for topological physics showing up. The first place where people saw topological phases was in something called the quantum Hall effect. So this was also in a two-dimensional material. This was in a layered structure called a two-dimensional electron gas, but essentially just means you have a thin layer of material and you change um, the voltages on your system so that all of your electrons are in this two-dimensional layer. And then you can do transport experiments on the system. So this might not mean a whole lot. Maybe you've heard about the um, classical Hall effect where if I have a perpendicular magnetic field and I apply a voltage across the system because of the magnet, because of the magnetic field, instead of moving just along the direction of the voltage, my electrons will actually curve because of the magnetic field. In the quantum Hall effect, instead of curving in a way that gives you this linear um, resistance versus magnetic field plot, you have this funny staircase pattern forming. And so this is a classic uh, signature of a topological phase where each of these plateaus, each of these steps signals a different topological phase. So I can see that there's some integer that's describing my different topological phases. And in order to detect that integer, I have to look at transport across the whole system. So I wouldn't be able to zoom in on any patch and do this type of measurement. Instead, I have to really look at something that is, that is global to the system. Another place where people look for topological phases is in exotic magnetism. So this is gonna be, um, you know, you have some chunk, chunk of rock. This is called Herbert Smithite uh, after Herbert, I believe, or Herbert Smith who discovered it. And, you know, you can't tell from just this picture, but if you zoom in and you look at how the atoms are arranged in Herbert Smithite, they form this kind of star-shaped lattice called a Kagame lattice. And these types of atoms have, um, have their lowest energy state when the spins are anti-aligned with their nearest neighbors. So this is something called an antiferromagnet. So generally, a system will want to be in its lowest energy state. But if I have a bunch of these triangles, then I have some frustration happening in the system where the spins can't quite all be anti-aligned because I have an odd number of nearest neighbors. And so this ends up frustrating the system. And this can mean that instead of having your conventional phases, magnetic phases and matter, you can instead have exotic magnetism and you can have something called a quantum spin liquid happening. So this is a kind of fun name. What it's trying to imply is that in a quantum spin liquid, you still have charge that's fixed to your crystal lattice, but the spin kind of separates from the charge. And so you can have spin that's kind of freely moving like a liquid, even though you have a solid chunk of material. So this is another place that's been a hot topic looking for topological phases. Now, the last example is maybe, you know, you're some theorist and you've come up with a toy model and you've written down all the properties that you want in a topological phase, but you can't actually find any material that satisfies all of those properties. Then you might try to design a topological phase by combining different materials. And so this has been the approach with topological superconductivity. So the idea here is this is a picture of an experiment where they've done a false coloring of the different materials. So they have indium arsenide um, in green here. So this is some wire. And then they've deposited aluminum around the edge of the material. And you can see this is very small. It's 100 nanometers. So this is called a nanowire. And the, what they find is if you apply a magnetic field to the system and you tune all of the voltages around it so that you should be in the right phase, you can actually make this into a topological superconducting phase. This is actually the Myron and nanowire that we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk. But before we do that, I just want to mention a couple of the interesting properties why people look at topological phases. So the first is these unconventional phase transitions. So this would be like the quantum Hall effect, where instead of having some continuous behavior through the phase transition, you see some really abrupt change where everything is fixed. So even though I'm changing the magnetic field here, 
the resistance stays quantized to this particular value until I undergo a phase transition and it, under, and it has this sudden jump. So this tends to be characteristic of uh, topological phases. You can also have something that acts like an insulator in the bulk of the system, but it will be a conductor along the edge. So this is also what happens with the quantum Hall effect. If you try to measure a current in the middle of the system, you'll see that it's an insulator. But if you measure a transport across the bulk, you'll see that I have these edge modes that are carrying all my electric charge through the system. And then lastly, you can have emergent fractionalized excitations. So this means that you can have the low energy excitations of the system, they'll act like particles, but they'll act differently than any of the particles that are actually making up the system. So for instance, in a quantum spin liquid, everything is really happening because of the atoms in the spin liquid and because of their electrons. And atoms and electrons, for instance, have this, uh, have this spin uh, charge uh, locking. So an electron always has a spin one half and it always has a charge E associated with it. But in a quantum spin liquid, I have these local excitations that look like they have no charge but have spin one half. So they look like some fraction of an electron. Or if I have one of these topological superconductors, I can have a different type of fractionalized excitation where I could think of this, uh, this myron and nanowire, I can think of this topological superconducting wire as being a chain of electrons where at either endpoint I have a dangling half an electron. So in this type of system, I have a fractionalized excitation where there's a single electron degree of freedom that's somehow been split and it only lives at the two boundaries of the system. So it becomes this non-local thing. So the next couple of slides are gonna be a little technical. I'm gonna to try to give you a flavor of why this happens, why I end up having these fractionalized excitations. Um, if you wanna zone out through these slides, it's totally fine. The main thing is that this type of topological superconductor can have these halves of an electron, which have this fancy name called a Majorana zero mode, where Majorana is just the guy who came up with this idea. Really, he came up with a related idea. Okay. But this also, I think, is useful because it gives you a sense of what a lot of work in condensed matter theory is like. Usually what we do is we want to study a system that's too complicated to fully understand. So we instead come up with a simple system that has the physics we're interested in, and then later we try to see if we can connect it to something that happens in real life. So the idea here is I want to have a one-dimensional system. So I want to have some wire, and I'm going to model that as a chain of electrons. And I'm going to model all my electrons by some number. So I have C1, C2 through Cn. If you've taken quantum mechanics, these Cs are meant to be electron operators. Now I want to describe the different energy terms in the system. So the first is it costs some energy for an electron to be on any given site. And I'm going to call this energy mu, uh, it's sometimes called the chemical potential. So this is just telling me the energy cost for an electron to be on a given site. I also want to let my electrons move between adjacent sites. And so I give this some energy T to describe an electron hopping from site J to site J plus one. And then because this is a superconductor, I also have some energy that pairs uh, electrons. So superconductors, instead of having individual electrons floating around that cost a lot of energy, every electron wants to have some, some pair um, and the, it's called a, a Cooper pair and it's kind of complicated physics, but the important thing here is just I have a term that I'm calling delta that tells me how much this electron wants to be in the same state as its nearest neighbor. Okay, and generally what we do is we identify all of these different energy terms and we combine them into something called a Hamiltonian, which is just the sum of the different energy terms for the system. Now a common trick for condensed matter theorists is to say, all right, I have some description of the system. I'm gonna do something that doesn't change any of the physics, but just changes the mathematics of how I look at the system. So here I'm gonna do a funny trick where instead of writing each electron as a single electron operator, I'm gonna split an electron into its real and imaginary parts. And so I'm gonna call these two Majorana modes. I'm gonna label them by gamma and gamma prime. The details of this doesn't matter. The important thing is I'm just changing the basis of the problem. I'm not changing any of the physics. I'm not adding anything new there. I'm just doing a different way of writing down the problem so I can study it. Now, if I rewrite everything in terms of these Majorana modes, then it turns out that these different energy terms can be split into how different pairs of Majorana modes talk to each other. 
So this first term, this mu term, couples the two green dots on the same electron side. So it couples Majorana as belonging to the same electron. However, these other terms that uh, were between nearest neighbor electrons end up coupling either the pair of Majoranas that have written as closest to each other, so gamma j prime and gamma j plus one, or they couple the two Majorana modes that have written as on the opposite sides of each other, so gamma j and gamma j prime plus one. Okay, so again, no new physics here, it's just a math rewriting of the problem. But now the reason that's useful is I can look at different limits of these different energy terms that enter. So if I'm in the limit where the largest energy term is coming from the cost for having an electron on a given site, then I end up being in what I call a trivial superconducting phase, where all of the electrons just act like a regular electron. And in particular, there's a lowest energy state that just corresponds to having electrons in every site. But if I'm in this other limit where the, the superconducting term delta is similar to this hopping term T, and they're both a lot larger than this chemical potential term mu, I end up being in this topological superconducting phase where all of these Majorana modes pair with a mode on the next site. So instead of pairing the modes that are on the same electron, I, oppose, I pair modes that belong to different electrons. And the important thing here is just that it leaves behind the leftmost and the rightmost Majorana mode. So these don't now aren't paired with anything. They have zero energy. So I call them a Majorana zero mode. And it essentially means I have now have this non-local electron. It's been split in two halves. OK, and then the last thing I should say is that the thing that makes this a phase is that there's some range of parameters. So I can vary this parameter mu, I can vary this parameter delta, and I can vary this parameter t. And there'll be some range of mu, delta, and t where it'll act like a trivial superconductor. And then I have to cross some phase transition to get into this other phase. So the reason I want to emphasize that is in condensed matter physics, I don't care if there's just one point that has an interesting physics. I care if there's some range where even if I don't tune exactly to this one point, I'll still see the same behavior, even if I'm a little bit off of it. OK, so finally, we can now connect back to a quantum computer. So for quantum computing, we wanted a qubit. So we wanted this quantum two-level system to store information in. The idea behind a Majorana-based qubit is I now have this two-level system, which is this electron that's corresponding to a Majorana zero mode over here and a Majorana zero mode over here. And I say that this is a two-level system because I can either have an electron that's spread out non-locally between these two ends, or I could not have an electron. And those have the same energy state. And this means that I can store information in this Majorana zero mode pair so that it's non-local. And that's useful because even if I have some noise on one end of the system, some noise in the middle, some noise on the other end, I don't care. My system's insensitive to that. It only cares about noise that couples the left Majorana zero mode to the right Majorana zero mode. And this ends up being exponentially suppressed in macroscopic ratios of the system. So this is going to be a term that doesn't really matter, but the longer I make this wire, the smaller the errors are going to be. Or the smaller I make the temperature, the smaller these errors are going to be. So that's really appealing from a quantum computing idea because we could just improve the system a little bit and we could make the errors much lower. Okay, so I think we're running low on time. So I'm gonna jump ahead. The next couple slides are basically, how do we actually go from this toy model of a Majorana zero mode nanowire to actually building it out of real materials? And so I'm just gonna go through these quickly, but the idea is essentially, I would combine different ingredients where I know how it changes my energy versus momentum space. And I do this to essentially combine these ingredients in a way that it has the same properties that I wanted from this toy model system. And so here, the particular ingredients, we're combining a superconductor, a semiconductor, having some gate to doing the voltage under the system, and then also having a magnetic field. So I didn't explain how that happened. But the key idea is just, I know certain properties about these different materials. So then I have a way of combining them to get the same phase as we were setting with the toy model. Okay, so again, this was all theory. The last thing I wanna emphasize here is that we, we now wanna go from theory to experiments. We actually wanna say, do, can we realize these Majorana zero modes? Can we build this type of topological superconductor? And 
The key idea here is that there have been a lot of experiments that have combined these three, ingredient, in th three ingredients, and they've seen some evidence of Myron zero modes. So for instance, here, this is really the same type of system. They have an indium arsenide nanowire that they've colored in green here. They have some superconductor here. So this is an actual picture of the device they made. And then all of these yellow things are metallic gates to change these different parameters. So to actually do the experiment and to tune the system into a topological phase. And so here, when they do this type of experiment, they can do a, a local transport experiment that sees a zero energy state appearing at the end of the wire. So that's some evidence of having a Meyer on a zero mode here, although there are also other possible explanations. This is a different approach to the same type of system. They have their indium arsenide nanowire. They have superconductor around the edge. This is yet another approach where now they have indium arsenide everywhere. And then they have this metallic gate on the top that makes all of the electrons um, under the gate go away unless they're screened by the superconductor, which here is aluminum. So this is just meant to say, this has been an active area of experiment. These experiments are ongoing. There are lots of challenges associated with these experiments that I'm gonna gloss over now, but if you're curious, I'd be happy to talk about it. And this is just an example of, this is the same device, a different picture of it. So this is kind of looking down the wire and then this is looking at a bird's eye view of how they actually do the type of transport and then they're looking at a conductance signature. So that's what this color scale is in a voltage versus magnetic field plot. And the key idea here is you can think of this voltage as being essentially the energy levels of the state. And what you can see is that for certain regimes of this magnetic field, you can have a zero energy state appearing. Okay, so just for the end of the talk, I wanna say a little bit about how I fit into all of this. So my, my research is going from Myron and zero mode, so going from having a single nanowire with these exotic Myron and zero modes, to how do you actually build qubits? And some of the questions that my research focuses on are how do you design a Myron and zero mode qubit? And this question is not just how do, I, how do I design a qubit that an experiment can actually build? That's a key criteria. But it's also how do I design it in such a way that it's going to be protected from noise? that I can do all of the operations that I need to on it in order to support a quantum computer? And how can I do it in a way where when I inevitably don't have a perfect system, when there's some dirt in the system, or there's some stray magnetic field, or there's some time fluctuations of the electrostatic environment, how can I design my qubit so that it doesn't really care about those details or it cares about those as little as possible? What is, what is my job? So I'm a theoretical physicist with Microsoft Station Q. And my job is answering those research questions on the previous slide. So thinking about building a Myron zero mode qubit, thinking about experimental imperfections and how do you design a system to, to withstand all of the imperfections that you're gonna end up with. And so my job involves meeting with a lot of other theorists, meeting with a lot of experimentalists, trying to understand what they've done, trying to connect the dots between our two different areas of research, talking to programmers who can simulate the systems that I'm trying to understand with my toy models. And so my job involves research, but it also involves a lot of talking to other people about what their research is and trying to explain my research to them. My research also involves a lot of the same things that academic research involves. So I still write papers with people and I post them on the archive and I publish them in journals, still give talks. So uh, I, you know, I'm giving this talk to you. I, I'm fairly new at my job, but I'm hoping I'll still, you know, travel to other universities eventually when the pandemic is over and give talks there. I still attend to conferences. And I still have the opportunity to advise students, either through internships or students who are doing their graduate work. But my job is not the same as an academic job purely, so I'm not a professor. So some of the main differences of what I do from uh, what a professor might do, who might be studying the same questions that I am, is that there's a different emphasis of my research. So I'm, you know, I'm part of Microsoft. Microsoft has certain goals for building this type of quantum computer. And so they'll have certain questions outlined that they need someone to answer. And so my job is not just to you know, understand this material because I'm curious in it. My job is also to understand and answer some of these questions that are necessary to advance these types of goals. This means that there's gonna be a different audience for my type of, for my, my work sometimes. So sometimes my results are publishable and sometimes they're really just meant for an internal audience. So I'll give a presentation that will never leave Microsoft or I'll spend time working on a calculation that's really just meant for 
another experimentalist who's you know down the hall from me or something like that. And lastly, I want to say, how did I get here? So how did I end up being a theoretical physicist interested in topological quantum computing? And the first answer to this question was when I was in high school, I lived in Anchorage, Alaska. I was really interested in cross-country skiing. I was really interested in English. And I took physics and I liked it, but I was pretty confident that I was not headed for a career in science. So I thought I was going to go into the humanities, maybe study history, maybe study English, something like that. And I went to college in Massachusetts at Williams College. And when I was there, I started learning about quantum physics and I suddenly realized, oh, I liked physics before, but now there's all these questions about superposition and entanglement that are keeping me up at night. This is really intriguing and I wanna learn more. So when I was in college, I actually, I did research after my sophomore year at NIST, which is National Institute for Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And that was a really transformative experience for me because that was my first time having a job where someone was paying me just to learn things. So that felt pretty incredible of, huh, I was interested in this and now I'm kind of just answering questions and trying to learn more about it and I'm getting a paycheck and they're paying for me to live here and I you know, get to be in this new place. So that was quite exciting. I then uh, did a research project at Williams in um, quantum information science. So I was doing a theory project on entanglement and I just love that work. I realized I'm not an experimentalist. I don't really want to be in the lab tuning my laser, aligning my mirrors. That wasn't for me. I really wanted to just do pen and pencil, um, pen and paper calculations, and really understand how entanglement works and try to make predictions, understand other people's experiments, but not actually be in the lab myself. And during that time, I started learning more about different ways that people are trying to build quantum computers. And that convinced me that I wanted to go to physics grad school and I wanted to go to physics grad school in something involving quantum computing, but I wasn't sure which aspect of quantum computing I wanted to do. So I ended up applying to grad school. I had a couple of different options and I ended up choosing UCSB, so University of California, Santa Barbara, because there were people there who were studying how to build quantum computers out of these topological phases. And I didn't go into this today, but there's a whole connection between entanglement and topological phases that I had heard a little about, I found fascinating. I didn't really know any of the details. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna dive into this new field of condensed matter physics. I don't know anything from college, but hopefully I'll just you know, take the classes and I'll learn it. And that was totally worth it for me. I learned this new field. It didn't matter that I hadn't studied it before. It just mattered that I was willing to be patient to give myself the time to take the classes, to ask the questions. And um, so I ended up in this field and I absolutely loved it. I did my graduate work with people who are at Microsoft Station Cube, but are also jointly associated with the university. So I was aware of Microsoft while I was there. I mentioned earlier that Microsoft Station Cube is actually in Santa Barbara, it's on the university campus. But I, I wasn't quite sure yet if I wanted to go the, the corporation route or if I wanted to continue on and try to pursue an academic career. So I did a postdoc for a year in Caltech with the group there. That was a lot of fun. I got to study similar types of problems, but also look at some new materials. And I liked that a lot, but I kind of missed Santa Barbara. I missed some of the questions I was doing as a graduate student. So I had an opportunity to apply to Microsoft. And then I started with Microsoft Station Q uh, last September. So this is kind of the path that I took, a little convoluted, a little bit flying back and forth across the country, gradually moving further south. Um, but now I'm in Santa Barbara studying topological quantum computing and I love my job. And I believe this is my last slide, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, actually, sorry, it is not my last slide. This is just my last slide about me. These are my last slides. So maybe you're interested in learning more. Maybe I threw a bunch of words at you. I didn't properly explain any of the concepts and you wanna really get to the bottom of what, are, what is superposition? What is entanglement? What are the actual problems that people are trying to use a quantum computer to solve? Uh, and how is a quantum computer actually faster? There's a ton of resources out there. There's a lot of really excellent self-paced learning material. Um, I'm just gonna plug the Microsoft quantum resources online, which are at this website. They have this really useful introduction where they go through the basic concepts. And then if you're curious, they have these, um, they have these self-paced learning modules where you can actually learn how to program a quantum computer. Or you know, maybe you can take a, a computer science approach to understanding some of the basic materials. So this is a really excellent research. If you're curious about learning more, there's a lot of other resources available online too so that I encourage you to check out.
maybe you're not so sold on quantum mechanics, but you kind of like this idea of doing research, but not doing research in an academic environment. You should also totally check out, for instance, microsoft.com slash university, where they have a bunch of internships listed for students and graduates. This can be a different type of research experience where you're studying some of the same questions, but in a different environment than if you did an REU or if you were at a government lab. Of course, we're not the only company that has internship opportunities for students. You know, probably anyone that you think of, if you Google their name with internships, uh, it will show up. But this would is where you would go if you were curious in particular about Microsoft internships. These internships are available for people at any stage of their academic career. So maybe you're a freshman, maybe you're a senior, maybe you, you know, are already starting graduate school. The only uh, prerequisite for an internship is that you're a student and then there's probably one that's a good fit for you. So with that, I'm now happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Knapp for the excellent talk. Um, so as I said before, if you have any questions, you're welcome to type them in the chat. Um, or, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can vocalize your question. Oh, I think I see a hand. So uh, Andrew, would you like to ask yours first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that was a really informative and interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned that if you're curious, you'd go into more detail about some of the challenges that uh, this area faces. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so let me just pull this slide back up. So we kind of ran out of time, so I didn't spend much time on this area, but the challenge with building a topological qubit is really getting that topological phase to get that first qubit. And so there does not currently exist a topological qubit. This is still very much in progress. My focus has been on this particular system of Majorana zero modes and these Majorana nanowires. And these experiments have had a lot of progress, but they also are experiencing a lot of challenges. And the first of these is because you're trying to engineer one of these topological phases by combining these different materials, it's hard to actually figure out where, where do I set my parameters to tune into the right phase. And this is just saying I have a really large parameter space. I need to choose the right materials. So here, you know, they're saying I'm going to choose enium, arsenide, and aluminum, and they're choosing them for certain properties. But there's also ex experiments done with different superconductors, with different semiconductors. You have to tune the magnetic field of the system. You have to tune the, the voltages around the system. So that's why all of these gates are here. And then you also have to know what type of signatures you're looking for. So what do you see where it's convinced you that you've seen a uh, Majorana zero mode in this case? And the tricky thing about that is the, the interesting feature of these Majorana zero modes is that there's something non-local about them that they've been separated into these two uh, boundaries of the system. And the hard thing there is it's really easy to do a local measurement. So to just probe one end of the system or the other, but it's hard to do a measurement that's really probing the entire system in a way where you can see that I have both my and zero modes appearing simultaneously and I still have an energy gap in the bulk. So the current status of these experiments is that they've seen a zero energy state appear locally, so at one end of the system by doing a transport type measurement. And they see that that only appears when you should be in a topological phase. So only appears when you have the right ingredients there and when they are approximately at the right values. Uh, they've done experiments where they probe both ends of the system. They see, okay, have a zero energy state appearing at the same time, but they're not quite able to say that's not just some coincidence and there's some local physics that's reproducing the same thing. So these experiments are at the stage where they're trying to go from the easy measurements to do that, sorry, from the measurements that are easy to do to the measurements that are harder to do that will actually convince you that there's something non-local happening. So these are all done with local conductance and essentially they're moving on to non-local conductance experiments. Those are in progress. I'm excited to see the results of those. But that's been the big challenge with these Majorana zero modes is how do you get to this conclusive evidence for Majorana zero modes and how do you avoid just having something that looks like what you want and saying, okay, now we've done it instead of you know, proving that it's not any of the other possible explanations. Thank you. Yeah. So our next question is in the chat. So Garrett asks, um, is there experimental quantum computing at Microsoft or is your group just theorists at Microsoft? Uh, there's a lot of experiment. Yeah, so in, so actually this is a good point. I should have, 
put up a slide with different Microsoft opportunities. Microsoft Station Q is in Santa Barbara, so we're in Southern California. There's experimentalists and theorists and programmers and mathematicians um, who are in uh, Seattle area, they're in Redmond. There's uh, materials physicists who are in Indiana and I'm revealing the fact that I'm from Alaska and I'm terrible with lower 48 geometry or geography. So I know Indiana is somewhere around here, but I don't know exactly where. Um, so there are material scientists who are working in a lab there. And then we have a lot of experimental groups in Europe, in Denmark, and in um, the Netherlands that are actually looking at, um, you know, they're shipped these material samples uh, from other places. And then they're looking at how do I connect um, all the right gates to do the types of experiments that I mentioned before, where I'm looking for non-local signatures of Majorana zero modes. And then there's also a lot of experiments that are being done in Sydney, Australia. So yes, it's mostly experimentalists, I would say, but my particular group in UC at UCSB is all theorists, but we are talking to the experimentalists. Awesome, thank you. So I think we're already a little over time, so I think we'll stop there. So thank you so much again, Dr. Knapp, for the excellent talk. And thank you everyone for joining us. So I'll say next week we have um, Dr. Louise Anderson, who comes to us from Google, so continuing on this trend of Microsoft Google people, um, who will tell us about her work from black holes to neural networks. I also want to mention next, week, next week's talk will not be recorded, actually. So if you want to hear that talk, you need, you need to show up, show up live, because that's the only time you'll be able to see it. So thank you, everyone, and thank you again, Dr. Nath. Thank you.